Just as a reminder, stupid things people do and what we can learn from them, it is not legal advice. It is stupid things. And while you can learn from them, you should probably consult actual legal counsel before making any kind of important decision. And so, without further ado, let's talk about Yankee versus Deer and Company. Now, try as we might, people are people, and people have a hard time staying away from indiscretion and scandal. There is just so much of it. I mean, so much. E even King Arthur had inappropriate dalliances. See, I told you this wasn't legal advice. Would legal advice be using fairy tales to prove a point? Well, it shouldn't. And if it's dooming that, you need to get a better lawyer. So, what happened? What are these dalliances I'm talking about? And didn't I say that we were done covering sexual harassment for now? Well, yes, I did. But this is a really interesting case, and it's really not what you would expect. See, instead of being about a young woman who's being victimized by a combination of idiocy and evil at her workplace, Yanke was a 60-year-old man working for a U.S.-based company, Deer and Company, as an expatriate in China. See, that's already super interesting. At least I think it is, because any time you have expatriates working for U.S. companies in foreign countries, you get a multicultural fruitcake of expectation and social mores, which is a perfect recipe for this precise log. Anyway, Yankee agreed to strictly observe the laws and regulations of the People's Republic of China and their code of business conduct. The China Compliance Committee would be in charge of enforcing that code of business conduct. And yes, that represents an incredible increase of just accountability and risk. But the job also came with some incredible benefits balancing that out. These were entirely unavailable to people working stateside. Y you know, little things like a hardship allowance, a living allowance, income tax equalization, and preparation for domestic and foreign tax returns. So it was a pretty great deal. Which got Yankee's libido thinking, how can I ruin this? It turns out sleeping with employees half his age that was a method of choice. Now, before you go, ah, there it is. While yes, this is a 60-year-old sleeping with employees twice over young enough to be his daughters, and that is a massive warning sign. Harassment claims is not how this went down. No, we have an entirely different kind of discrimination claim. I'll explain. As it turns out, engaging in sexual relationships with employees who are within your span of control violates the code of business conduct. Which, I mean, duh. After investigating, the China Compliance Committee repatriated Yankee back to the United States. You can't very well work in China if you've been kicked out of China. So Yankee began his new job as a program manager for John Deere in Waterloo Works in Iowa. Now, it should not come as a shock that this position did not have the same level of cushy benefits as his previous position. Uh, no hardship stipend, less pay, and nobody to do his tax returns for him. Yankee felt that this was a negative employment action and not the natural consequence of ticking off the CCC and getting kicked out of the Middle Kingdom. Yankee also felt that his dalliances would have been treated differently had he not been a foreign 60-year-old male having sex with women half his age. Never minding that the rule violated had more to do with the employees being under his direct control, and less to do with the age, national origin, or gender of the offender. But, cleverly, Yankee claimed that the rules were enforced more strictly for him than they would be for a young Chinese woman. And if that were true, legally Yankee could have a point. In addition to complaining that he was treated differently than a young Chinese woman, Yankee also felt the response to him sleeping with women half his age and under his employ was due in part to stereotypes about 60-year-olds. So he sued Deer & Co., which left them going, wait, what do we have to do with a China Compliance Committee kicking you out of China? Now, if you've been paying attention, you know that Title VII protects the rights of employees who are working abroad for U.S. employers. Which means, under Title VII, if these events happened as Yankee described, he could very well have a claim. The thing is, Yankee didn't sue Deer and Company under the auspices of Title VII. He did so under the auspices of the Iowa Civil Rights Act, ICRA. And while Title VII explicitly applies to U.S. citizens working for U.S. companies employed abroad, the ICRA does not have that explicit language. So, Deer filed for summary judgment, claiming that they couldn't be sued for extraterritorial disputes that occurred entirely outside of Iowa. Or, in layman's terms, dude, you're suing us for something that happened in China, not here. But the district court ruled against John Deere, finding that, yeah, no, you're working for a company based in Iowa, so the ICRA is involved. However, upon appealing the decision, the Iowa Supreme Court had a different take on it, and that's where things get interesting. The Supreme Court of Iowa considered two questions. First, does the ICRA 
actually have extraterritorial reach. Well, Title VII does. And like Title VII, the ICRA is a civil rights act, so intuitively you would think so. In fact, in our last Stupid Things, with the Washington Law Against Discrimination, it was determined that, yes, that law should be interpreted in the same way as Title VII. So if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander, yes? Well, if the goose is Iowa and the gander is Washington, that's not exactly how state laws work. State laws are wildly variable in terms of what they say and how they should be interpreted. And this is based on an incredible array of factors, including judicial precedent. That's why lawyers are licensed to practice in specific states. And regarding the ICRA, in Iowa, there is a presumption that unless a statute specifies that it has extraterritorial reach, that it does not. The Supreme Court found there's nothing in the language, purpose, subject matter, or history of the ICRA, which would indicate it applies extraterritorially. In other words, what happens in Iowa stays in Iowa, and vice versa. The second question they examined was also jurisdictional. Whether the discrimination that Yankei claimed he experienced happened in Iowa, China, or elsewhere. And this is a little different than what we talked about previously. We talked about previously whether or not ICRA applies to behavior outside of Iowa. Now the question is, did this behavior happen in Iowa or out of Iowa? And this is important because Yankee asserted that the ICRA still applies so long as the case involves citizens of Iowa or a cause of action or rights that arose in Iowa. Basically, if it involves Iowa citizens or involves actions that happened in Iowa. And the Supreme Court determined on this point that Yankee's residency was not in Iowa, but was in China, and that his conflict was with the China Compliance Committee, which was a uniquely Chinese problem. I mean, it's right there in the name. And they also found that the China Compliance Committee was solely responsible for investigating, reaching a decision, and describing a punishment for Yankee. Deere and company was not even involved until the compliance committee informed them of their decision to repatriate Yankee. And by then, their decision was limited to how to best find employment for their suddenly globetrotting employee. Now, in point of fact, there was some ambiguity as to whether the employment decisions had taken place in Illinois. And the Supreme Court determined that Yankee may have had a claim under the Illinois Civil Rights Law, or even Title VII, but since no employment decisions were made in Iowa regarding Iowa residents, they determined that China was outside the jurisdictional authority of the ICRA. This means that ultimately, the Supreme Court of Iowa reversed the court decision, and this means that the case got dismissed on summary judgment in favor of John Deere. So that has so many turns, it's like a Yu-Gi-Oh episode. So what is the stupid thing we can learn from it? That's the important question. Well, two main things. First, there's the stupid thing of Yankee sleeping around with young employees who were under his control. AKA, he was their supervisor. Seriously, age aside, if the Me Too movement has taught us anything, it's that these power dynamics are rife with risk for abuse, especially for quid pro quo harassment. Now, it is fruitless to speculate on whether or not abuse actually happened, but there is a reason the Code of Business Conduct in China does not allow for that kind of behavior. Now, that said, if Yang Kei really was treated more severely than a younger woman would have been, that's bad. That could very well have been a Title VII violation. Whatever your code of conducts are for your organization, they have simply got to apply universally. And this gets to the second stupid thing, which is why in the world didn't Yankee sue under the auspices of Title VII? Uh, okay, maybe this isn't as stupid as sleeping with your employees. And I'm not his lawyer, so it could very well be that his lawyer didn't think they could win a Title VII lawsuit. So this might not actually be a stupid thing. But I'm listing this here because this is a critical detail that we can learn a lot from. See, for any lawsuit, there can be multiple laws that apply. State, national, international, even municipal laws can affect certain lawsuits. And laws don't always mean the same thing in different states. And this case is a perfect example of that. As I mentioned last month, we discussed the Washington Law Against Discrimination, and that law is interpreted in light of Title VII, meaning that the accommodations of Title VII are assumed to apply to the Washington Law Against Discrimination. But with the ICRA, 
And with regards to jurisdiction, that's interpreted very differently than Title VII. The ICRA is interpreted, as we discussed, to only apply to Iowa and not to international jurisdictions. By comparison, Title VII specifically applies to international jurisdictions. These differences and similarities are not always obvious to laypersons. For that matter, they're not even obvious to lawyers and judges. The way laws interact, it's incredibly complicated. And on top of that, laws are often interpreted through judicial precedent. Basically, judges make decisions and interpretations based on how courts have ruled on similar matters in the past. And that is really hard information to have at your fingertips if you're a layman. And even if you're not, it is an incredibly complicated process. It's one of the reasons we have a system of appeals with lower courts and higher courts. It takes an incredibly skilled infrastructure of legal experts to adjudicate the law. This brings us back around to the beginning of stupid things. This is not legal advice. And legal advice is critical because laws are complex. So the next time you see your lawyer, give them a hug. Or actually, don't do that. Or if you do, make sure they'd like a hug first. Hugging people who don't want to be hugged can get you in trouble. That said, getting in trouble is how you get onto the show. So decide for yourself. This is Stupid Things, and I'll see you guys next month.